Hi there. Thank you very much for playing the Beginner's Guide. My name is Davey Reedon. I wrote The Stanley Parable. And while that game tells a pretty absurd story, today I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened between 2008 and 2011. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. So just to start you off, this is, I think, the first game he ever made. It's a level for Counter-Strike. You can walk around here, by the way. And uh, mostly it's just Coda learning the basics of building a 3D environment. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, it's 2008, Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet, he just makes them and then immediately abandons them and they sit on his computer forever. And I think he really understood this image of himself as a recluse. Uh, at one point he jokingly renamed his computer's recycling bin to Important Games Folder. So, you know, this was just how he worked. He tended to crank them out one after the other without even really pausing to try to understand what he had just made. Until suddenly one day, he just stopped. In 2011, that was it. He made his last game and then he hasn't made another one since. And that's why I've taken this opportunity to gather all of his work together. is because I find his games powerful and interesting, and I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. Okay, that's about it for introduction. Let's take a look at Coda's first proper game. As each game is loading, I'll show you the date that it was completed. This first one was made in November 2008. This game is called Escape from Whisper, and it's one of the more generic games you'll see from Coda. You can click to fire the gun. Security call breached. Hostile alien life form inbound. It kind of looks like this game was abandoned mid-development. For instance, you have this gun, which you'd think would indicate that there are supposed to be monsters or enemies somewhere, but then clearly there are no enemies anywhere. You can't even reload the gun when you run out of bullets. But ultimately we don't really know. Maybe Coda thought that actually it was complete the way that it is. And I think that we should talk about his games for what they are, rather than for what they're not. Enemy force neutralized. Begin shoot evacuation. I love how you can see the bottom of the universe from this room. Apparently the space station has a labyrinth on it. I... Uh, sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip you on past it. 
Okay, this is the part that's interesting. The game has this narrative about the whisper machine and how it has to be turned off, and then you get to the engine room. Hey, you there, in the engine room. You could save us all. That beam is powering a whisper machine. We could disrupt it by introducing a great enough heat signature. If you... Your body could stop the beam. It's so much to ask, but for all of our lives, would you do it? Could you give yourself? Let me pause here for a second. What you just experienced, stepping into the beam and then dying, is probably what Coda had initially intended when he was developing this level. But when he first compiles and plays it, something goes wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And this is what happens instead. The beam causes you to start floating. And this is an important moment for him. Because yes, this is technically a glitch, but Coda identifies something human about it, like how small it makes you feel in the face of this larger chaotic system. Or this floating could be the afterlife, a peaceful place juxtaposed against all of the hysteria that you've just had to traverse. I, I don't even know. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking, but what's clear is that after making this, something lodges itself in his brain. He wants to do more of these really weird and experimental designs. So he stops work on this and moves on to a stream of tiny little games that go in all sorts of directions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first game he made after leaving this one behind. Yep, in this game you can only walk backwards. So it's a short and relatively minimalist experiment combining motion and narrative. It is less advanced than the previous game, but actually it seems to be more focused, more complete. Code is trying to give it a unique voice rather than simply basing it on a pre-existing trope. It's a short little thought, it says what it wants to say, and then it ends. Didn't need anything more than that. Which to me is why it works, because it gets out quick. Okay, next one. And that's it. Okay, the meaning of this game won't be clear just yet. Please be patient with me for a few more games and I promise you'll see what makes it interesting. Oftentimes, Koda would put bizarre titles like this one at the start of his games. I wish I'd known him at the time that he was making these early games. He would really only talk to me about his work as he was making it. Once he stopped work on a game, like, that was it. It was dead to him. And I don't agree with that at all, but what are you gonna do? Once you've been slowed to an absolute crawl, the door at the top of the stairs opens. So why, if Coda's not showing these games to anyone, why bother opening the door at all? Well, to show you, I'm modifying the game here so that when you press enter, it'll bring you back up to full speed so you can enter the door for yourself. A 
room that's warm and nice and filled with little ideas for games. Coda would often tell me that he didn't mind if people thought of him as cold or distant. He said that he knew that he was actually a vibrant and compassionate person, but that it takes time to really see that. It can be a very slow climb to get there. Well, this is new for Coda. It's an actual puzzle. Go ahead and see if you can solve it. Don't forget that solution, because we're going to see this puzzle again soon. We're going to see it a lot. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down a corridor, you solve the puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game, since they essentially convey the opposite idea. So, uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. And then, in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same. Is that most of the time, you don't get to know what you're missing. Or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role as a player. So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? Aha! So, this, combined with the entering game from earlier, tells us that Coda believes his games are connected somehow. It could even be that the stairs game and the puzzle game are literally connected in between this and the entering game. There's a bigger picture that all of his games are meant to play a role in, some larger meaning that we won't be able to grasp until we've seen all of them. And once we have, we can step back and start to understand what exactly that bigger picture is. Let's talk about video game development for a second. Every video game runs on what's called an engine, which determines what the game can and cannot do. So in other words, the engine is a set of tools for game development. To make all of these games, Coda is using an engine called Source. Like all engines, Source has certain things that it does well, and it has certain things that it does poorly. One of the things that it does very well is boxy linear corridors. That's why so many of Coda's games are set in these large, flat, empty rooms, is just because he's working with what the engine does well. The tools available to the creator shape what kinds of creative work they're going to end up making. You might consider paying attention to the architecture in Coda's games, to notice how they seem to stem from an engine that's very good at producing linear, boxy corridors.
this prison. Funny enough, in Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. If you don't mind, I think we're gonna skip that. This is something that he and I used to argue about a lot. You know, whether a game ought to actually be playable, whether it means anything if no one can get through it. And I would always defend that, you know, all this work goes into the game, why not make it playable and accessible? And so we just got into heated arguments over it, and there was one time that after one of these conversations, he went home, and a day or two later, he sent me a zip file entitled Playable Games that was full of hundreds of individual games, each of which was just an empty box that you walked around in and nothing else. Believe me, I played every single one of those just to find out if there was like a gag hidden somewhere. There wasn't. It's the puzzle again, with the exact same solution as the last time. There's still no clear indication of what makes this puzzle so special that Coda is going to return to it over and over. But I promise I'll share with you my interpretation very shortly. Here, Coda begins using a kind of dialogue system that he fashioned out of the engine's chat capabilities. Use the one, two, three buttons on your keyboard to respond. And so we make one last descent down to the final floor of the level. It's a lamppost. Okay, I can't tell you quite why, but for some reason, Coda fixates on this lamppost. It's going to appear at the end of every single one of his games from here on out. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I think that up to this point, you know, he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe you can only float around in that headspace for so long. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination, which is what this lamppost is. It's a destination. We're going to see it in the work as well. His games are just going to become a lot more cohesive, a lot more fully developed, with more of a clear idea behind them. And as we go, that idea will get clearer and clearer and clearer.
So first off, I'm sure you can deduce this, but this game is not connected to the internet. All of the notes that you're going to see have been written by Coda. This was actually the first game of his that I ever played. This was shortly after I met him at a weekend game jam in Sacramento, where I grew up. I saw him working on this very level, and it was just so different from anything that anyone else was doing. So right away I was like, I have to be friends with this person. In retrospect, I think I was probably a bit too pushy trying to get his attention. Uh, I was over-enthusiastic. But he was very gracious about it and very patient with me. And I cooled off eventually. Oh, feel free to skip over any of these notes if they're not doing anything for you. Nothing extra is going to happen if you read all of them. Either way, to me they convey a sense of loneliness. I see this person who's filled with thoughts and feelings and beliefs and has no way to express them except as scattered and unheard voices in a game that wasn't meant to be played. But it's ironic, isn't it, that in playing this game and seeing how alone Coda often felt, that we get to know him better and actually kind of connect with him. And I have to be honest with you, this idea is really seductive to me. That I could just play someone's game and see the voices in their head and, and get to know them better and have to do less of the messy in-person socializing. I could just get to know you through your work. I think this is why I always liked Coda's games so much, is because it felt like they let me have that connection. I felt as though he was inviting me personally into his world. And then I feel less lonely too. At the end of this level, we're going to see the puzzle again. And here, I'll tell you what I think the puzzle means. Each of these games represents an idea that was on Coda's mind at the time that he was making it. And the puzzle is a way of closing the door on a previous chapter of his life before moving on to the next one. In each of his games, after exploring a theme that, you know, he might find difficult, Coda can then place this puzzle that he knows has a reliable solution, he understands exactly how it works, and so it gives him a simple mechanism for moving on. And because there's this dark area between the doors, a space between the spaces, before you move on, you get to pause. Just for a moment, a few seconds to reflect on and let go of the events that led you here. To step back and connect the pieces together. To grasp at that elusive bigger picture. Okay, this one is tough. It's gonna kinda just spin its own wheels for a few minutes. Hang with it.
See, like, this is it. The whole game. And there's nothing that's particularly interesting about it. You just walk to the end of a hallway. Except, for some reason, Coda gets really fixated on this prison that has all of this modern furniture. And I don't know why, but he decides he needs to revisit this prison. He's gonna start over, use the same assets, turn it into something else. Okay, cool. Here's version two. There's a bit more to this one, but still, it's not really communicating anything. It, it's kind of just weird for weirdness' sake. So, okay, he throws it out and starts over. This time he comes at the prison idea from a different direction. And of course, now the table is gone and you can't begin the chain of events to escape. Here's a version where there are no bars, but you can't actually get to the well. And then a version where the inside of the prison is the outside and the outside is the inside. Let me just blink you real quick through a few more of these. I mean, he really unloaded on this prison idea. There's nearly a dozen of them. Personally, I think it's awful to watch this, to see a person basically unraveling through their work. And for what? Like, at what point do you just go, eh, maybe there are game ideas other than this prison that I could be working on. But Coda doesn't have that voice telling you to stop, that particular mechanism of defense against yourself. Without it, you just spiral. And so he keeps going and going and going and going and going, and then he hits on something. And he likes it. And that's it. He's done. He stops making prisons. This is the very last version of the prison game that he created, and the reason I think it works is that the prison is not actually in it. It's a conversation. And so this is what Coda wants, is to be able to talk to someone, to share what's on his mind, and to get some good advice from someone who knows. But the irony is that even in this scenario, you're still talking to yourself. You know, all of these games so far are Coda talking to himself.
I can see why he considers this a fitting conclusion to the prison games. After all of the obsession and frustration, just to be told by someone you can trust that things are going to be okay, wouldn't that be nice? So what would it look like if Coda wanted to make a game about talking to someone other than himself? To me, this environment is meant to represent Coda's puzzle, with the two doors on either side and a dark transitional space between. You'll notice that the quality of the art is a step up from previous games, including this new and improved chat system, which he started using from this point on. From here on out, he begins putting much more effort into the visual polish of his work, and this particular game took two months to create as a result. After the intense set of prison games, this house cleaning level almost feels like cleansing. It's the moment after a particularly difficult or traumatic experience where you just need to let it sit and digest inside of you, and eventually cohere into something meaningful. I know that Coda really liked this game. Of all of his work, actually, this was the only one that he called me up to ask me to come over and look at it. This was during a period of a few months where he was, like, grossly happy all the time, just walked around with a constant smile on his face. I'm glad he made this. I'm glad he found some peace. But, of course, it can't last. The music stops, your companion is gone, it's time to leave. The door at the top of the hill is now open as well. Again, you can't stay in the dark space for too long. You just can't. You have to keep moving. It's how you stay alive.
Which is the whole point of the puzzle doors, right? That sooner or later you have to pick up and move. I really thought that was the point of it. This one gets a bit goofy. About halfway through the game, the perspective shifts. And you play as the teacher. And suddenly, you discover that your teacher is just as bigoted and afraid as you are. Oh, and also you can move around the classroom now. pretty hard for this one. I feel like it's one of the most relatable experiences that you can have. To uh, assume that some other person is perfect and totally fulfilled in every way and completely miss all of the little flaws that make them painfully human. I think about this game a lot these days. This one took a lot longer than all the others for Coda to make. It was four months between this and the last one. That's twice as long as it took him to make any other game before this, and it's not like it's particularly complex, so I remember I found that a little strange at the time. Thank you. 
The game ends with this eerie premonition of what's going to happen next in Coda's life. The solution to social anxiety, to fears of having to perform and having to chase success, the answer for Coda is to withdraw, to hide himself away. Which is what leads to scenarios like the stairs that slowed you down several games ago, where it just becomes harder and harder to access Coda's inner landscape because he keeps retreating. He just keeps backing away from possible connections to anyone other than himself. And to be honest, I didn't consider it very healthy when I first played this game. You know, it, it looked to me like he was trying to justify the idea of just disconnecting yourself from the world. And that wasn't what I wanted for him or for his games. Because I feel like a lot of his games are inviting me to connect. To connect with this person. To bring him closer. But what can you do? After this, Koda went off and took another five months to make a new game. You should probably open your eyes if you haven't already. It's pretty much impossible to solve otherwise. And there is a solution, by the way. Like I said, I was getting concerned. First off, he's never been this explicit in his work about exactly what he's thinking. So where's that coming from? But then even weirder, his work has potentially stopped being an outlet for him. Not like he's having trouble iterating on ideas, but he literally just can't think of new ideas anymore. And in person, he was being a lot more distant than usual. Like, you know how sometimes a person will just deflect anything that you say in order to keep themselves disconnected all the time? It was that kind of thing. Here was the point in my relationship with Coda where I really started to wonder if he needed my help in some way. His games are going to get more desperate from here on out. After this game, it's almost six months before he finishes something new.
If the last game featured Coda talking explicitly about his creative frustrations, this one turns it up to 11. Now, put yourself in my shoes playing this. Here's a friend whose work is exhibiting signs of struggle, frustration, anxiety, depression, even. And yet, still, he keeps making games. He keeps throwing himself into the grinder even when he clearly doesn't have the energy for it anymore. Why? What is it for? Because from my perspective at the time and, and just what I knew of him, this was a result of how isolated he was. He was in his own little bubble, just sitting at his computer all day, not really showing these games to anyone, uh, not releasing them onto the internet. And so he didn't have anyone outside of himself to connect with. He had no outlet to ground himself on. You can't talk yourself out of loneliness. It doesn't work that way. You can't be the one writing both the questions and the answers. Then there's no movement. Then there's no circulation. If all of your anxieties are being channeled into your work, then if the work ever fails, you have no backup and you're just going to crash. Seeing this game at the time that he made it, it looked really unhealthy to me. I was watching him do this to himself, and I hated it. I hated seeing him so trapped. It's like, video games are not worth this amount of suffering. This is someone I really cared about, and I used to get so much joy out of seeing him create. For him to suddenly become angry and frustrated like this, it was the worst thing for me. I don't know. This is what I felt at the time. I don't know how else to explain it. I wanted it to stop more than anything. I had never felt so rotten. I just... I needed more than I had ever needed anything for this to stop. But it didn't stop. After finishing this one, Coda takes another seven months and comes up with a new game. And of course, it's the machine.
so now the work is becoming self-destructive. And I'll tell you, at the time that I first played this game, shortly after he made it, here's what I'm thinking to myself. I'm thinking that Code is stuck in his own head, and that it's having a very negative effect on him, and that all he needs to do is just start showing his work to people, to get some actual feedback on his games. It might get him out of isolation. And so, as I'm thinking this, I realize that I could be the one to initiate it. Because it would never occur to Coda to start actively soliciting feedback, so what if I did it for it? If he could see the difference it would make to have more actual conversations with other human beings, would that bring him out of his mental spiral? Would it give him confidence in himself? Would it bring meaning back into his work? So I started showing Coda's work to people. I took this one, and the islands which you just played, the theater, the notes, the house cleaning game, and some of the prison escape games. I brought them to people that I knew and, and trusted. I asked their opinions. And the great part is that they really loved his games. You know, the point of it all was just to give them some external reference point, but they, they genuinely loved his work. There was nothing for him to be afraid of. Can you see why I felt like this was the right thing to do? Because it's the thing that I always feel like I need, to be told that my work is good, that I am good. When, when someone really connects with a thing that I've made, when they see themselves purely in my work, there's nothing that feels better. And I got to give that very same feeling to my friend. I did something, I really felt like I'd done something good, like, like, I was a good person. I felt like there was a friend who was in trouble and was unhappy and, and maybe didn't like themselves, and I could fix it. If I could give him this gift, maybe I could fix the problem. When they told me how much they enjoyed his games, it was the best feeling. It was the absolute best feeling. It, it made me feel so happy. So beautifully, beautifully happy. Um, so anyway, Coda finishes this game, and then really he just kind of takes off for a while. So this is June of 2011, and I didn't hear anything from him for several weeks, I guess. Um, and so out of nowhere, one day I get an email, and it's got a private link to a new game of Coda's. This one is called The Tower. And to my knowledge, it's the last game that Coda ever made. So let's take a look. And this is where I have trouble saying anything meaningful about Coda's work. Because more than anything else, the tower just feels distant. It feels like it's trying to distance itself from the world. It's a very cold game. This room actually has a maze in it. Except that all the walls of the maze are invisible. And then every time you touch one of the walls, there's this awful flashing and noise. So the experience is really miserable. The game goes beyond not being meant to be played. It actually seems to despise the player for trying to play it at all. But I do want to show you the rest of the level. So when you're ready to continue, press enter and I'll put a bridge over the maze.
And to be fair, it's not like this is the first game that's needed some modification to be playable. Like the house cleaning game. You know, that one used to actually loop the cleaning chores and you just cleaned a house forever. I had to cut it off so that you could exit the house and the game would actually end. But that game had an idea that it was actually trying to communicate. What's the deeper idea behind the invisible maze? The only way past this challenge is to randomly guess the six digit code. Like the invisible maze, it's frustrating to me because it's the opposite of everything else that Coda has made. It doesn't encourage thought or engagement. It doesn't ask anything of me except a lot of my time. If I could have reached him during this time, then maybe I could have asked him, but I couldn't. I still don't really understand why this is here. I'll put the code on the ground for you here though so that we can move on. The switch to open this door is actually on the other side of the door, meaning that it's literally impossible to solve from this side. So even if you somehow brute forced your way through the first two challenges and you got to this point, there's actually just no way to progress. And it's scary for me, the idea of Koda cutting himself off entirely, just saying, you know, that's it, that's the end of the conversation, not giving me any way to fix the problem. I feel like a failure, I guess, when I can't fix the problem. But I can open this door for you, so let me do that. Was I a failure for not understanding this game? I, mean, I don't know why I would be. It's not like everything needs to have a solution, but I feel it somehow. I feel like I failed, and I don't understand why. I remember, it's June of 2011, I'm playing this for the very first time, and as I'm playing, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know this person. I have no idea who this person is. It wasn't the guy I knew, it wasn't my friend. I had come to so many conclusions from looking at all of his work up to this point, and then suddenly none of them... I had been trying to, though, that was the thing. For years, I was trying to get to know him, to understand who he actually was and, and what he stood for. I asked him so many times to please just tell me what his games mean to him. I asked him please to tell me what the three dots mean. And he wouldn't. I just felt so strongly that if I could have connected with him, that if I could have somehow made his work my own, that I would finally be once and for all happy. It was that I needed to see myself in someone else. I needed to be someone other than me. But he stopped and left, and it felt somehow like I had failed. Where did I screw up? I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? It's because of what I did. I poisoned it for you.
I don't think I ever told you this, but when I took your work and I was showing it to people, it actually felt... <laughs> it felt as though I were responsible for something important and valuable. And the people who played them, they treated me like I was important. They really listened and cared about what I had to say. Even though I was showing your work, it was... I felt good about myself. Finally, for a moment, while I had that, I liked myself. And then you stopped, and I didn't have anything left to show people. I, I just had to be with myself. And as soon as that happened, there was no feeling at all. Nothing. Less than nothing. What does that mean? I'm afraid that I did something really stupid because I don't like myself. That's why I'm releasing this collection of your work is because I haven't been able to find any other way to reach you. I've tried everything. And so a part of me has hope that if I put this compilation out into the world, and if I put my name on it, that maybe enough people will play it so that it'll find its way to you, so that I can tell you that I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? Please. I need to feel okay with myself again, and I always felt okay as long as I had your work to see myself in. I mean, is, is something wrong with me? Because I know that I did an awful thing, and I'm doing it again right now, like I'm, I'm showing people your work, but I can't stop myself from doing it. That's how badly I need to feel something again, like I'm an addict. There has to be something wrong with me. Can I apologize? What if I tell you I was wrong? Will that work? Will that fix it? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it will, but there's nothing else that I can do. Just tell me what you want. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please, start making games again. Please help me. Please give me some of whatever it is that, that makes you complete. I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. And I want to know how to, how to, I want to know how to be a good person. I want to know how not to hate myself. Please. I'm fading, and all I want is to know that I'm going to be okay. More, 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 more love, more praise, more people telling me that I'm good. Always more, more, more. It's like a disease. Solution, solution, solution. I guess if someone had told me ahead of time that he just really enjoyed making prison games, maybe I wouldn't have thought he was so desperate. I wouldn't have told so many people that he was depressed. Maybe he just likes making prisons. Even now, the disease is telling me to stop. Don't show people what a shitty person you are. They'll hate you.
If I knew that my life depended on finding something to be driven by other than validation, what would that even be? <laughs> it's strange, but the thought of not being driven by external validation is unthinkable. Like, I actually cannot conceive of what that would be like. What now? I think I need to go. And I'm sorry, because I know that I said that I would be here and I, and I would walk you through this, but I'm starting to feel like I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot that I need to make up for. And so I'm just gonna... Okay.
came.